If the individual is sufficiently sensitive, they become aware of their terrible emptiness. This abyss cannot be filled with the vulgar entertainment of drugs, nor with the entertainment of churches or social amusements. Nothing will fill it. Knowing this, fear grows, which drives us to dependency, and this dependency makes us increasingly insensitive. And seeing that this is indeed the case, we feel afraid. The question now is how to transcend this void, this solitude, and not to learn to depend on ourselves or permanently disguise our emptiness. Can the mind face that emptiness and live with it, without fleeing? What is love? What is compassion? The word compassion means passion for all, affection with all beings, including animals, the same animals you kill to eat. Is there love if there is violence, hatred and antagonism? Don't belong. Be free. Jiddu Krishnamurti. So what will you do? Our lives and our morality are contained within this violence and hatred. When we reject them, we are virtuous. This means understanding the full meaning of love. You are then alone and capable of loving. Listen to this because if you do not live this truth, it becomes a poison. If you hear something true and dismiss it, it will produce another contradiction in life, and consequently, more suffering. Therefore, you either listen with your heart, with your whole mind, or you close your ears. For the man who loves, there is no mistake, or if there is, he knows how to correct it immediately. All of this requires deep investigation, but you are trapped in the snare of modern society. You created the trap yourself, and if someone draws your attention to it, you dismiss it. And thus, hatred continues to exist. Be cautious of the man who describes the unknown, the truth, or God to you. Such a description of the unknown offers you a means of escape. Moreover, truth defies any description. In this escape, there is no understanding, no realization. In escape, there is only routine and decay. Truth cannot be explained or described. It simply is. I affirm that there is a beauty that cannot be put into words, for if it were, it would be destroyed. Then it would no longer be the truth. But you cannot know this beauty, this truth, by asking about it. You can only know it when you have understood the known, when you have grasped the full meaning of what lies before you. Therefore, you are constantly seeking escapes, and you dignify these attempts to escape with various spiritual names, with grand-sounding words. These escapes satisfy you temporarily until the next storm of suffering comes and sweeps away your refuge. Now, let us put aside the unknown and concern ourselves with the known. Set aside for now your beliefs, your slavery to traditions, your dependence on your Bhagavad Gita, on scriptures, on your masters. I am not attacking your cherished beliefs. I am telling you that if you want to understand the truth of what I say, you must try to listen without preconceived ideas. 
Our entire system of thought, as well as our social structure, is based on the idea of acquisition. We look to the past because we cannot comprehend the present. To understand the present, which is experience, the mind must be relieved of past traditions and habits. As long as the weight of the past dominates us, we cannot comprehend. We cannot fully grasp the essence of an experience. Therefore, there must be incompleteness as long as there is the pursuit of acquisition. And the central idea of our social structure is also one of acquiring success. But because I said that your pursuit of this idea of acquisition will not result in complete living, do not think in terms of the opposite. What I want you to do is question this idea. Our entire social, economic and pseudo-spiritual structure is based on this idea of profit, profit from experience, profit from life, profit from teachers. And from this idea of profit, you gradually cultivate in yourselves the idea of fear. Because in your pursuit of profit, you are always afraid of loss. Having this fear of loss, this fear of missing an opportunity, creates an exploiter, whether it be the man who guides you spiritually or an idea to which you cling. You are afraid and want courage, thus courage becomes your exploiter. An idea becomes your exploiter. Your attempt to achieve profit is merely an escape, an escape from insecurity. When you speak of gain, you are thinking of security, and after establishing the idea of security, you want to find a method to obtain and maintain that security. No teacher founded these organized exploitative religions. You yourselves, out of insecurity, out of confusion, out of a lack of understanding, created religions as your guides. Then, after establishing religions, you seek gurus, teachers. You seek masters to help you. To be intelligently critical, you must be free from personal prejudice, from personal opposition. And to be intelligently critical, you must first understand that thought is influenced, limited, fanatical and personal, even if you have not been consciously aware of this dependency. First, you must become aware of this. We are aware that biologically, physically, and psychologically, we are attached. Are you aware that you are physically attached to things? And are you aware of the consequences of these attachments? If a person becomes aware of being attached, can that person instantly abandon that attachment? Then there is a battle between the demands of the body and the decision of the mind. So what do you do? I see that I am my habit. My habit is my own self. Let us investigate, learn not only how to look, but also that from this very act of looking comes action. How can the mind cease any of these habits without any effort, knowing that all effort implies duality, implies resistance, condemnation of the habit, the desire to transcend it, repressing or fleeing from it. If I am entirely concerned with my own fulfillment, with the realization of my ambition, with competing and my desire for success, I cannot see humanity as a whole. Analysis requires an analyst. Try to perceive the division between the analyst and the thing analyzed. In observation, there is no separation. 
There is observation without saying I like it or I don't like it. Here is what you must do. Instead of merely theorizing about the subject, any dependence on subjective imagination, fantasy, or knowledge generates fear and destroys freedom. If you do not understand freedom, not only externally but above all internally, if you do not understand it deeply and seriously, not just intellectually but truly feel it, what we are about to say will mean little. We have been considering the nature of the mind. It is the serious mind that truly lives, that knows the joy of living, not the one that merely seeks entertainment, satisfaction, and self-fulfillment. Freedom requires total repudiation, the total denial of all internal psychological authority. Rejecting internal authority does not necessarily mean that one is completely free of all inner authority. When we understand internal authority, the mind and the heart become totally and entirely free, and we are then enabled to comprehend the external action of freedom. Man must be alone, but this being alone is not isolation. It means being free from the world of greed, hatred, violence, its subtle methods, and human loneliness and despair. Being alone is being outside, not belonging, not belonging to any religion or nation, to no belief or dogma. It is this solitude that achieves an innocence completely immune to man's malice. Only innocence can live in the world, with all the disorder that exists in it, and at the same time, not belong to it. One of these two videos has been chosen for you. Thanks for watching.